The step-by-step process that is used, was used by the press, first they fanned the flame in such a manner to create hysteria in the mind of the public, and then they shift gears and, and, and fan the flame in a manner designed to get the sympathy of the public. And once they go from hysteria to sympathy, the next step is to get the public to support them in whatever act they're getting ready to go down with. You're dealing with a cold, calculating, international machine that's so criminal in its objectives and motives that it'll, it, it has the seeds of its own destruction right within it. They use the press to emphasize that white hostages are being held by cannibals. Imagine that. Or, or white, hot, white priests, white missionaries, white nuns. They don't say nuns. White nuns. You know what the paper said right here in Detroit. White missionaries, not just a missionary, a white nun. As if there's a difference between a white nun and a black nun, or a white priest and a black priest. Or if, or if, or if, or if, or if the life that's in a white skin is more valuable than a life within a black skin. This is what they're implying. And the press, go get the press when this thing was going on. And you see what I'm talking about. They're vicious in their whiteness. But still, I wouldn't judge them just because they're white, because they call me a racist. <laughs> judge them by their deeds, by their conscious behavior. And you know how they've been consciously behaving in the Congo, and how they consciously behave in, in, in Vietnam, and how they consciously behave right now in Alabama and Mississippi. So you and I got to get conscious and start behaving in a way that we can offset this thing before it's too late. And this is what they don't want to hear. One more thing concerning Shambi, if you notice, the, and I must go all over over there on the African continent in order to give you a better understanding of what's going on right here. The next thing that uh, is good to know about Shambi, no Congolese troops have ever won any victories whatsoever for the present Congolese government. Congolese soldiers won't even fight uh, unless they're forced to. But the fighters in the Congo were the freedom fighters. These brothers from the Oriental Eastern province. And they fought with stones and sticks and, and, and rocks, spears and arrows. And the only time they had a gun was when they got some soldier who had it, and they'd kill him and take his gun. But they were winning. They took over two-thirds of the Congo, showing you they were fighting from their heart. Whereas these other people, their heart wasn't in it. And because of the fighting spirit of these people, it will be impossible for Shambi to remain as head of state over the Congo without... Uh, additional troops, white troops, constantly being brought in uh, from South Africa or elsewhere. But sooner or later, these troops are going to give out, and then America is going to have to increase her troops, like she did in, in South Vietnam, you know. She has, uh, she's not at war over there, you know. They're only over there advising. they got about 20,000 advisors, you know, on the front line. But it's, they're not, it's not a war. It's just an they're in an advisory capacity while they insult the intelligence of their own public. And, uh, they're going to have to end up doing the same thing in the Congo. They'll be trapped. Uh, they'll have to e eventually send American troops to occupy the Congo because the African freedom fighters are going to fight. They're not going to give up one inch without fighting back. And this is something that you should know, that they, they realize now on the African continent what's at stake and how much uh, all of these Western powers have in common and what they're doing in cahoots with each other behind the closed door. So on the African continent, they are training Africans to be soldiers so that they can invade each one of these countries and take it over and give it to their rightful people. One of the reasons, uh, the, one of the last things I must say concerning the Congo, not only do they not intend for the Congo to fall into African hands because of its mineral wealth, and it has the greatest deposits of some of the richest uh, elements or minerals of any other area on this earth. They don't intend to give it up because of its wealth. Another reason they don't intend to give it up, if you look at the map, you'll see that it is uh, so strategically located geographically, wherein if a, a real genuine African government were to come in power over the Congo, then it would be possible for African troops from all countries to invade Angola, which is a Portuguese possession, and, when, and if Angola fell, and it would fall, then it would only be a matter of time before Southwest Africa, Southern Rhodesia, and Bouchwanaland also would fall, and it would put African troops right on the border of South Africa. And that's where they really want to get at that man down there in South Africa. And the United States interests are involved in blocking this. Yes, some of these liberals who grin in your face like this, face like 
They're your best friend. They got money tied up in the Congo. Some of the most powerful political figures in this country. Some of them governors over states. Got interest in the Congo and got interest in South Africa and got interest all over the African continent and go there. And as the Africans awaken and realize this, they, it makes them uh, filled with the incentive to never rest until that exploiter is driven out. So now, what effect does this have on us? Why should the black man in America uh, concern himself since we've been away from the African continent for 400 years, three or 400 years? Why should we concern ourselves? What impact does what happened to them have upon us? Number one, first you have to realize that up until 1959, Africa was dominated by the colonial powers and by the colonial powers of Europe having complete control over Africa, they projected the image of Africa negatively. They projected Africa always in a negative light. Jungles, savages, cannibals, nothing civilized. And, well, and naturally, it was so negative until you, it was negative to you and me. And you and I began to hate it. We didn't want anybody to tell us anything about Africa, and much less call us an African. Uh, and, and, uh, and in hating Africa and hating the African, we ended up even hating ourselves without even realizing it. Because you can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. You can't hate your origin and not end up hating yourself. You can't hate Africa and not hate yourself. And you show me one of these people over here who have been thoroughly brainwashed, who has a negative attitude toward Africa, and I'll show you one that has a negative attitude toward himself. You can't have a, you can't have a negative attitude toward yourself, a positive a attitude toward yourself, and a negative attitude toward Africa at the same time. To the same degree that your attitude, that your understanding of, an attitude toward Africa becomes positive, you will find that your understanding of and your attitude toward yourself will also become positive. And this is what the white man knows. So they very skillfully uh, made you and me hate our African identity, our African uh, characteristics. And you know yourself that we have been a people who hated our African characteristics. We hated our hair. We hated the shape of our nose. We wanted one of those long dog-like noses, you know. Yeah. Uh, we hated the color of our skin, hated the blood of Africa that was in our veins, and in hating our features and our skin and our blood, why we had to end up hating ourselves. And we hated ourselves. Our color became to us a chain. We felt that it was holding us back. Our color came to us, became to us like a prison which we felt was keeping us confined, not letting us go this way or that way. And we felt that all of these restrictions were based solely upon our color, and the psychological re reaction to that would have to be that <clears throat> as long as we felt imprisoned or chained or trapped by black skin, black features, and black blood, uh, that skin and those features and, and that blood that was holding us back automatically had to become hateful to us. And it became hateful to us. It made us feel inferior. It made us feel inadequate. It made us feel helpless. And when we uh, fell victim to this feeling of in ina inadequacy or inferiority or helplessness, we turned to somebody else to show us the way. We didn't have confidence in another black man to show us the way or black people to show us the way. In those days, we didn't. We didn't think a black man could do anything but play some horn, you know, some sounds, and make you happy with some songs and in that way. We, but when, uh, in serious things, where our food, clothing, and shelter was concerned, and our education was concerned, we turned to the man. We never thought in terms of bringing these things into existence for ourselves. We never thought in terms of doing things for ourselves, because we felt helpless. And what made us feel helpless was our hatred for ourselves. And our hate from, hatred for ourselves stemmed from our hatred of things African. Long about 1955, they had the Bandung Conference in Indonesia. And at that time, the Africans, the Asians, the Arabs, all of the non-white people got together and agreed to de-emphasize their differences and emphasize what they had in common and form a, a working unity. And it was the working unity, the spirit of Bandung created a working unity that made it possible for the Asians who were oppressed, the Africans who were oppressed, 
uh, and others who were impressed to work together toward getting, getting independence for these other people. And it was the spirit of Van Dunn that brought, brought into existence this working unity that made it possible for nations that didn't have a chance to become independent to become it. They did come into their independence. And most of this began along in 1959. And at 59, the spirit of African nationalism was, was uh, a flame, was fanned to a high flame. And the, we then began to witness the complete collapse of colonialism. For, uh, Af uh, France began to get out of French West Africa. Uh, Belgium began to make moves to get out of the Congo. Britain began to make moves to get out of Kenya, Tanganyika, Uganda, uh, Nigeria, and some of these other places. And although it looked like they were getting out, they pulled a trick that was colossal. In that when you're playing basketball and they get you trapped, you don't throw the ball away. You throw it to one of your teammates who's in the cliff. And this is what the European powers did. They were trapped on the African continent. They couldn't stay there. They were looked upon as colonial imperialists. So they had to pass the ball to someone whose image was different. And they passed the ball to Uncle Sam. And he picked it up and has been running it for a touchdown ever since. He was in the clear. He, wasn't, he was not looked upon as one who had colonized the African continent. But at that time, the Africans couldn't see that though the United States hadn't colonized the African continent, he had colonized 22 million blacks here on this continent. Because we're just as thoroughly colonized as anybody else. When when, when the ball was passed to the United States, it, came, it was passed at a time when John Kennedy came into power. He picked it up and helped the runner with one of the shrewdest backfield runners that history has ever recorded. He surrounded himself with intellectuals, highly educated, learned, and well-informed people. And their analysis told him that the government of America was confronted with a new problem. And this new problem stemmed from the fact that Africans were now awakened. They were enlightened. And they were fearless. They would fight. So this meant that the Western powers couldn't stay there by force. And since it, uh, their own econo economies, the European economy and the American economy, was based upon their influence, continued influence over the African continent, they had to find some means of staying there. So they used the friendly approach. They switched from the old, open, colonial, imperialistic approach to the uh, benevolent approach. They come up with some benevolent colonialism, philanthropic colonialism, humanitarianism, or dollarism. Immediately, everything was Peace Corps, crossroads. We've got to help our African brothers. Pick up on that. <clears throat> Can't help us in Mississippi. <clears throat> Can't help us in Alabama or Detroit, out here in Dearborn, where some real Ku Klux Klan live.
A. Sadi from below and Sadi from above something was clear from the huge list of tribes that we reproduced about the formation of the Sadi Zulu Mongo Regency. There was a need, based on the principles of leadership and management of the tribes, for a population distribution after the arrival of the Nampemba Empata and companies in those lands. It is in this context that the first villages will be born after the foundation of the Sadi Zulu Mongo Regency. Simao Toko proposes the following. Our tribe, Nampimba Mapata, continues to multiply and then half of this tribe left the Kibokolo and went to Makela du Zambos, in the people called Mbanza Sadi, Regadoria, that had two peoples, satellite villages, which are, Mbanza Mpambu Sadi and Mbanza Mpambu, where my father in Dombele Lovumbu was born, Bidopo. Simao Toko, we can still confirm in Ansiao Sebastiao Kyongolo, 2015-2016, then head of the Namadungu family, who offers us pioneering reports on the creation of the two villages of Sadi. In this regard, Kyongolo stresses, Entinu Ensaku as a pilgrim, coming from Nakunsu M. Pete, municipality of Damba village of Kisoba Nanga about his stay in Kibokolo, he married a woman, Enkozi Nakama, in Bangu Kingom or Kibokolo. After leaving Kibokolo, he took to Sadi his land, with his sons and daughters. When they multiplied, they began to form satellite villages. Sebastiao Kyongolo, 2015-2016. In this way we will go on to describe the two villages both from above and from below, according to the undertaking of the analysis of the sources we own. I. Sadi from above. Mbanza Mpambu from these illustrations. We can proceed with the description of Sadi from above popularly known to Mbanza Mpambu Sadi. According to Araho Mfinda Mpambu Sadi was considered in the past as shopping center. He founded on May 30, 1769, by Ensundi Go Ensaku, with the authorization of his father Ensaku Ne Vunda. According to the sources he was nominated as a soba for the reason of being a warrior, in order to better manage the market and surveillance of the enemy, invaders. In the article published in the vast magazines and online internet pages about the village of Mbanza Mpambu Sadi, Mumbeliano Maziko edition advances that the village until 1801, had more than 97 residences for 790 inhabitants occupies an area of 9,117 kilometers and a military training center. Mbanza Mpambu Sadi politically starts from the Regency of Sadi, east of Kiloongo, Regidoria, very far from Mbanza Mpambu and Zulumongo, and much closer to the territory of Kiwembo. It maintains in relation to Mbanza Mpumbus and its Mbanza Ne Congo, a position of criticism and independence, which keeps them in common as just on the fringe of clan affinity. Still in the territorial scope, despite being a little misrepresented by Tokoist elders, it is in this village where the Luii and Kukapitao, captain, families were born. Araho Daniel M. Find a Sadi from below. Mbanza Mpambu the word, Mpambu, as guaranteed by the Mumbelian edition Maziko, 2017-2, is of Kikongo origin which means, junction, diversion, or, crossroads of paths, whereas, Mbanza, means, city. According to Jean Cuvalier, 1972-20-31, and Gabriel Bortolomani, 2016-34, Mpambu is the denomination attributed to the Mpambu tribe to Gengai, which can be risibly translated, the sovereign of the throne, having affinity with the tribes from Mpambu to Mbenza, Mpambu to Labando and Naloango, Ntu Nkozi. Village of Mbenza Mpambu it was considered as the religious and priestly center, where the religious chief and guardian of Mwene, or Ensadilu Z Saba, resided, guidelines and functioning of the tabernacle, in this case, Ensamu Kukala. Jean Cuvalier, he adds along these lines the importance of the place in the spiritual realm. Now they have received it with rights. You have indicated to me that, priest, that I will deliver guidelines, functioning of the tabernacle. They announced, the one who will receive the guidelines. Jean Cuvalier, 1972-20. So far, the village of Mbanza Mpambu, was founded on the 12th of July 1820 by Soba Mbala Z. Biba, with the authorization of Ensakun Vunda, Dom Manuel, 
It occupies an area of 10,213 kilometers. In the census carried out in 1800 by the missionary, Reverend and Pharmacist Bello, Beal, under the leadership of Dr. Chefe, the village had just 107 residences, a royal palace with Moanansi, attached a traditional treatment center, a religious temple, tabernacle, Impambu had approximately 1,109 inhabitants. Politically speaking, Mbanza Impambu is located to the west of the village of Zulumongo, divided by the river Manwana below, to the east by the village of Kiloongo Kai Makumbani and the river Inkingulu, to the north by the mission of Intaya Novo and to the northeast by the Sadi region, in the distance. Ziezo, 2017, Lukoki, 2016, and edition Mumbeliano Maziko, 2017-5. Still on the misunderstanding, which revolves around the divisions of the two villages, Simao Toku made the following clear in his writings. These two peoples, Mbanza Mpambu and Mbanza Zulumongo, separated from the Manuana River. But when they joined the Natemu people, these people separated from the two rivers, Manuana and Malima. But as the waters of Malima were of no use, the two peoples drank water from the Manuana River. You can ask my uncle Mapimbele Masakelo or Daniel Msingi, he will tell the truth, that Simao is not lying. Simao Toko, the 29th of August 1973, in the territorial scope as we said before, it was in this village where the Mfinda and Kabeta Domingos family were born, according to Simao Toko, 1955-1973. It is in this village where their parents were born. Therefore the historiography of this village is confused with that of Mbanza Zulumongo. Today many elders in Tokoism even authors and writers as well as the new generation of sadists, in this case the Nampemba Mapata they think that Mbanza Mpambu is the same thing Zulumongo. E. Z U L U M O N G O. City of the Great King, Mbanza Zulumongo village is where we were born. If I'm not mistaken, my sisters Idila Luketo Mlandu and Yidia Katoko and Dingani may ask, can they give the best explanations of the people where we were born because many accusers and informers inform that the Simao Toko was born in the former Belgian Congo, they say what they don't know. Simao Toko, 1973-1. to The aforementioned passages remind us of Zulumongo's origins and the authenticity of the various information that over the years has been misrepresented as we will see below. The word Zulumongo, as it was said right at the beginning of the work is of Kikongo origin, which in the Portuguese language is translated, risky, top of the mountain, in this case, Zulu, top or sky, and Mongo, mountain or mount, that means village built on top of a mountain. According to Sebastião Kyongolo, the mountains that are implanted in the Zulumongo are Kichimasiko, I don't send for it, Mount of Nakoki, Creeper or Harvester, and Mount of Inkinkozi, Lion, for the elder these mountains form the top of Zulumongo. Historically speaking, the village of Zulumongo was founded on April 23, 1860, by Soba Nadolamingo Mapembele Ensamu Kukala, husband of Dona Asana Luwengo, Susanna, and Entandwa Meso, under the authorization of Soba Mbala Z Biba de Mbanza Mpambu Sadi. Both guided by Entinu Insaku Ne Vunda. According to the written sources Simao Toko, Pedro Mumbela and Araho Daniel Mfinda Zulumongo is one of the first three villages of Sadi's regency, Mbanza Mpambu, Sadi, Mbanza Mpambu and Mbanza Zulumongo the largest of which was the Entinu Ensaku Ne Vunda, Manuel Na Sadi, of the Nampemba Mapata clan, Lovila of the Nampemba Nakosa lineage. Zulumongo is according to its geographical characteristics, a. Located in the district of Zambo, in northern Angola, province of Oog, municipality of Makela Ma Zambo, next to the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo on the right side of the road that connects Mesiki to Kimpangu. As we can read in Santos Agostino, 1999-35, b. Located in the area surrounded by the Lunzamba and Enzolo, Natulumba region, c. Located between the mountains of Kilowangu, Sadi and Nakanzo di Avalulu, d. 
located between Kambembe and Kambembe bordering the Kimpengu Mission, RDC. So far, Zulumongo is the best known region of the 120, 120 villages that made up the former Sadi Zulumongo Regency, because it was the place where the prophet Simao Goncalves Toko, Mayamona, was born, 1918 to 1984. According to the survey by Alvaro Talento, Lt. Buddha, Mbuda, and the census carried out by the missionary, Reverend and Pharmacist Bello, Beal, and Dr. Chief, Mbanza Zulumongo, owned more than 100 residences, which a traditional treatment center, built in typically handmade adobe, a tailoring or roofing that was Dundu Insimba, an iron foundry workshop, which was used to manufacture hoes, machetes, picks, hammer, nails and weapons, makela, coordinated by Ndambele Lovumbu, tabernacle, place of prayers and a literacy school, whose teacher Pimbele Masakelo Nsingizi Matwa and later in the 1920s was replaced by Domingos Ramos Cabeda. B. The insignia of the Zulumongo power open to the truth. To paraphrase the Mumbeliano Maziko edition, 2014 to 2017. Sadi Zulumongo is a place that deserves a very in-depth study in all aspects, anthropology, sociology, history, linguistics and archaeology. As a regency whose village where the prophet was born Simao Toko, 1918-1984. So far, it is quite clear that the chapter of Zulumongo's insignia, the new field that opens up for further study regarding the political power of Sadi Zulumongo, in this preamble, we will mention just a few insignias that we think are pertinent and that was linked to the leadership of Ndambele Lovumbu, while going up. I. Nlunga Mai Mawene, Guideline Rings. The Guideline Rings, known in Kikongo de Lunga Mai Mawene, were composed of two or three rings that form the Nlunga, it was also known as Mawene. Throughout our research we found two brands of Nlunga, Ring, A. Iron of manufactured by the metallurgist, blacksmith, who diffused the iron. According to the testimonies, the iron bracelets, were used by the highest entities of the village, in this case, it was up to the Nadolamingo Pimbele Nsamu Kukala, Mbala Biba and Ndambele Lovumbu, B. Aid wood manufactured by the carpenters, according to the Sobas these bracelets were worn by the 12 advising elders, of the Soba and the women of the great Sobas, in this case, the Dundu Nsimba and Asana Luwengo, Antonio Natela, 1989, is unanimous in saying that the same rings or Nlunga Mai Mawene was also used by the priests who worshipped Nizambia Labando. So according to the elder in the scope of the petitions, the three rings were placed on top of the other. If it crashed then the region was in danger of calamity of various kinds such as deaths, mental disorders in families and in the people, drought and infertility, until the renewal of the pact and asking for forgiveness from the ancestors. E. Coronation Medal or Emblem The Coronation Medal or Emblem is another insignia of the power of Sadi Zulumongo the same was decorated to the Soba at the time of his election. It was a medal with writings, patent, in the center and an illustration, drawing, of two crowns with the crosses, according to the Sobas and elders, the medal means, a. A Victoria achieved in the elections b. Acceptance by ancestors c. Coronation, power and agility in directing the people for the Sobas and even elders of the Nampemba Mapata tribe. The medal could not leave the body until the date of the next elections or in the event of death. E. Kunda Kia Ntinu. King's Chair, Soba. The chair of the Soba or seat of the king. Gathered at least 12 elders, the so-called advisors around him, 10 men and 2 women, in this case, the wife of the sovereign and the woman of the priest. The chain symbolizes the Soba's room. Some Sobas and elders argue that the idea of Zulumongo's seat in political power would come from Mbanza Congo where the Nampemba Mapata come from, according to Adolfo Salterum as part of the constitution of the royal councillor. In the bibliographic survey carried out to support our thesis raised about the insignia of the Sadi Zulumongo power, we can understand that the seat was only for the under power, the remaining 12 councillors representing the 12 tribes mentioned above, some had the mat, kayandu, others had goatskin, some lion or leopard skins, 
so on as we can see in the development of each clan or lovila that composes them. Jean Cuvillier, 1934-1972, and edition Mumbeliano Mazico, 2018-23. The sources indicate, at least in the bibliographies consulted, that the leadership of the Sadi Zulumongo Regency belonged only to the Nampemba Mapata and not to the clergy tribes, we can see in Ndolomingo Kukala, Nsundi Go and Ndombele Lovumbu, hence the recommendations of Ndombele Lovumbu, his father, on his deathbed to Antonio Capito Mfinda, as we quote, Take the child away from me, don't you know that death is very ashamed? Mfinda, take this child named Mayamona Menji out of the tribe. Mfinda, don't you listen? And I still tell you that you must treat this child very well, take care, and send him to his residence. Because, despite being a small and innocent child, he must be a great and prestigious king. Ndombele Lovumbu, 1925. Despite the contextualization of systematic Tokoist theology, such as another religious field having analyzed the words of Ndombele Lovumbu in another aspect, in the traditional and cultural scope we can do other analyzes, where the same words were seen as a verbal testament to the transfer of power from the chair of the Sobado to Simao Toko because as Soba, as mandated by the African tradition in particular Bantu as read in Alpha I Sao and Path Diane and Double A Gramigo, 1987-86, Simao Toko at the time was the prince and heir to his father's throne. More interestingly, it is not this analysis that we want to do in this study related to the chair. If we look closely at the last words of Simao Toko's father, who says, there must be a great king, then here the problem of empty chairs that links in Tokoism opens up, and that they almost exist in all the tabernacles of the directions where it defends the name of Tokoismo having the origin from the Soba and Dambele Lovumbu. I.V. Kingongolo. Signet the signet or kingongolo in Kikongo was a sound instrument used to cut the sobado of Sadi Zulu Mongo, to transmit the message from the palace of the sobado. Likewise it was also the instrument used to alert the danger. It is the same used in Battle of Zulu Mongo, to the rear of the troops as confirmed in Antonio Cartanega, 1940-243-301. Its use in the Congo and Zambo tradition dates from 1573, as we can read in Antonio Cavazzi, 1965. In short, Kingongolo is interpreted as being the messages from the royal house. V. Ngoma. Mbandu, Batuk, Ngoma or Mbandu was the symbol of the power of Zulumongo characterized as an instrument of dialogue, dance and music was seen as a representative expression of the Soba. According to Alberto Dundu, 1951-6, the Ngoma was played, Batukata, by the three elements known literally in Kikongo of Ashiki Z Ngoma connected to the residents of the Soba. C. Cultural aspects of Sadi Zulumongo The culture of the Zulu people, Zulumongo, or Sadistas is the mixture of several peoples and clans that formed the Zulu people. There was no perfectly homogeneous culture of the people of Zulumongo but rather, a wake of different and verdant cultures that form the culture of Zulumongo. These mergers arise because of the crossing of the twelve clans, tribes, Nampimba Mapata, Benga Kai Wanayukala, Namiala, Nsaku Elao, Na Mazinza, Mapimba Nsungu, Viti Mini, Naloango Na Vunda, Na Madungu, Nafutila Na Wembo, Mpambua Nzinga and Ntumba Avimba. So it is very clear that the Zulu Mongo culture is mostly from the Congo route where everything has its origin. It is actually this Congo cultural heritage that made up the unity of the people of Sadi Zulu Mongo. Therefore, we do not allow under any circumstances to mention some elements that make up the culture of the people of Sadi Zulumongo. For more buy the book on Amazon type Mikhail Massa.